So welcome everyone, Kurosanga. Thank you, Jill, for coming and speaking with us today. Um, Jill is a teacher for True North Insight based out of Ontario, Anishinaabe, Waki, Canada. And they are a death doula and an end of life doula. And um, I apologize, I don't know the topic of discussion for tonight, but um, thank you again, Jill, for coming, and uh, I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you, Diane, and everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, it feels like a homecoming to me. This is a very dear heart sangha um for me but i haven't been able to come for i don't know how long it feels like years um because i teach at 7 30 usually so i have a guest teacher for my usual um sangha at this time and i'm so happy to uh feel like a homecoming really i see some familiar faces and some new faces and uh it uh it really fits with the theme tonight, which is around rest as a requisite, um, because when I'm in safe space like this, my heart, body, mind sighs <laughs> and uh, feels <sighs> um, safe and rest restful here. So thank you for providing that, and uh, it feels very very dear to be here. Hmm. So I might just um, jump into the topic and then I'll be popping some links into the chat and in the YouTube recording, we'll put the links down below for you as well. Uh, and then we'll have a meditation um, from that, from this inquiry, from this theme. All right, so the topic tonight, putting a title on things, is rest as a requisite. And um, so this this comes from, in the, in the Dharma, in the teachings from the Buddha, they came from an oral tradition um, shared through oral teachings. And so these teachings were often formulated into numerical lists. And I'm sure you've um, heard some of them, uh, but for instance, the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, the Seven Factors of Awakening, the Five Precepts, the Six Sense Doors. I mean, we could go on and on with all the numbered lists. And the understanding is that this way of systematizing would have been a helpful way to for the monastics um, and the carriers of this oral tradition to memorize the teachings and therefore to pass them on. And so all this is uh, to say that one of the lists um, that you might not have heard of, it's not brought up as often in as some of these other ones that I first mentioned, by the way, if you don't know any of those lists or have no, that doesn't matter at all for the context of, of what we're going to explore together tonight. Um, uh, it's just a, a context. So one of these lists that isn't talked about very often, I don't think. Uh, some people have said, oh, I've never heard of that. Where's that from? Uh, is what's referred to as the four requisites. And these four requisites call, come from a collection called the Vinaya. The Vinaya is a grouping of um, teachings that guide and support the monastics community to live safely and well together. Um, and originally, there was no Vinaya uh, or for the original um, community that was living with the Buddha. 
um, because it was a small group and they worked it out and figured it out and they were following their ethical precepts and guidelines and things were pretty cool, apparently. So I've heard. And so um, as the community grew and more and more and spread and um, lay people joining and uh, et cetera, there, as, as happens, conflicts would arise or somebody would come in with uh, old habits and unskillfulness and be causing harm. And so the rules and the precepts, the guidelines grew and grew and grew <laughs> until they became, became really big. Uh, so this is the context of where you would find these four requisites. It's, it's contained in this Vinaya collection, <clears throat> which supported people to live well and safely in community. So <clears throat> these four, there's these are the four primary requisites, and then there's a whole bunch of secondary ones. Um, are uh, could be called or are offered as what does a monastic need? What does a monk or nun, a renunciate? What do we really need? What are the basics that are necessary in order to practice, in order to really um, be on this path? The Buddha said that there are four requisites, um, clothing, food, lodging, and medicine. Um, so I'll just read you uh, what what the context is in that monastic uh, context there. So it's written and from the oral tradition. Properly considering the robe, I use it simply to ward off cold, um, to ward off heat, to ward off the touch of flies, mosquitoes, simply for the purpose of modesty and covering the parts of the body because um, at the time there were and still are, um, what's the word, renunciates that would practice without any clothing and that was part of their practice and that wasn't the tradition here. So that's the use of clothing is really just to keep the body warm and protected from uh, exposure to the sun and and bugs and modesty. And then for food, in this case, it would be alms food. So what a monk would uh, in their alms bowl receive that support from the community so that their body is nourished and they can offer the Dharma to the community. Uh, considering alms food or food, I use it not playfully, not for intoxication, not for putting on weight, nor for beautification, but simply for the survival and continuance of this body, for ending its afflictions and supporting the holy life. Thinking, I will destroy the feelings of hunger and not create new feelings of overeating. And I'll maintain myself um, and live in comfort. So this is what it says for food. Properly considering lodging, I use it simply to ward off cold, to ward off heat, um, to ward off the touch of flies, mosquitoes, wind, sun, and reptiles, <laughs> simply for protection from the inclemencies of weather and, and for the enjoyment of seclusion. I like that part. <laughs> Um, and lastly, properly considering medicinal requisites that are used for curing illness, I use them to counteract any pains of illness that have arisen and for the maximum freedom from disease. So these are considered the basics, like for a monastic, part of this tradition and teaching, I'm not a monastic, so... This is my understanding from reading the suttas, the teachings as they've been written down um, and studying those. 
that um, for monastics, this particularly, these four requisites are a teaching in contentment. They're a teaching in abandoning desire and also in not fueling pride, in ego, self thing. And um, so they're really like this is this is the minimum of whoop, I just went all fuzzy. Sometimes this happens. I'll just turn my video off and back on, and that usually fixes it. It did. Um <laughs> and okay, so for a monastic, it's it's a bit of a different flavor, I'd say, that it's really a a teaching around and practice around this is all you need and not to fuel more consumption and greed and um, delight and pleasing ourselves and all of this. And there's some quotes here from the suttas to back up the, what I'm saying here. Um, it goes on. And how is a bhikkhu content? So a bhikkhu is someone practicing um, in particular, a monastic person in this case, just like a bird, just as a bird, wherever it flies, it flies with its wings as its only burden. So too, one is content with a set of robes to provide for their body and alms food to provide for hunger. And wherever one goes, they take only their barest necessities along. And this is how a bhikkhu is content. So there's what I was saying about this is really about, you know, just being content with what you have and what you receive um, in a monastic context. Um, and to see these as tools to train and develop the mind. This is what's needed in order to continue practicing training the heart mind for liberation, for freedom from suffering. Um, so really lately I've been reflecting more on these requisites of, you know, what, what does that mean for myself, for us, if we're not monastics? What, and there's a slight, I think it could be, might be helpful to explore a slight different lens on these requisites. So it's not just that's all you need that the monastics are undertaking this is all you need um but this is what you need it's a little bit different this is what we need so what things are really really necessary and what things are really necessary <laughs> um so when we bring a liberation lens to these four requisites, we see that this is what all beings need. And are we expecting ourselves and others, maybe if we're, especially if we're meditation teachers, to be able to meditate or to, to join our sanghas or when they don't have secure housing, they don't have access to adequate health care, nourishing food. I would also add clean water as a requisite. Absolutely. Um, we could just put that in with food, I guess, but it's not listed. I don't think it could be added. <laughs> How presumptuous. Adding things to the Dharma. Um, so similarly to like the bodhisattva vow you may have heard of, of um, that for, for the, the liberation of all beings, we first need the requisites for all beings. That no one is free till we are all free. So it's, yeah, yeah, I think there's a lot here to explore around, you know, uh, really who has access to these very basic primary 
supports for the heart, body, mind, and who doesn't? And um, who then is able to really deeply practice liberation, meditation, and who isn't? So this brings me to the next aspect of this talk, which is rest. And when I'm writing the word rest, I write it with a capital R, <laughs> rest. Um, and so this topic began for me as a response to my own practice these days for quite a while. Um, the primary way I would describe my practice is rest. And that feels pretty radical to me and different than how I was taught and am often still taught uh, to, you know, strive and, and to really work on concentration and, uh, you know, kind of a efforting in the practice. And I'm not dissing these, uh, but I want us to explore hmm, what values have we internalized that are not liberation values. So for me, uh, it it all I I notice it's almost like an, a little inner mantra through my day rest rest like I. I noticed this morning I was, you know, going from piano lesson to pickleball and I was kind of got home and changed, had a little something to eat and then walking quickly down the path and it just shows up as it does through the day rest, rest. And so as I continue walking to the car, I didn't get there any later, <laughs> it was just an internal rest rest and just walking instead of that push mm, energy that is uh, part of our capitalist culture. Uh, it also shows up for me just as couch time. I just lay down whenever I can through the day. I'm fortunate I often work here from home or I'm home in between teaching outside and various things so I can just when there's a little window just lay down it's so great <laughs> and I realize not everyone has that possibility um I'm just talking about how it's showing up for me I I just lay down I'm not a napper I'm not able to like sleep in the day um it's probably happened a few times in my life but I've probably been sick or something uh it just but just laying down and doing nothing is so sweet, so sweet. Um, so there's that internal resting even when doing is happening and also just the physical resting and not doing anything where I'm really not like resting my eyes, resting my hands. There's so much greed in this internal system. Hungry eyes, just wanting, wanting, wanting. Hands always busy doing phone addiction and or, you know, just always reaching. And to just rest the eyes, rest the hands. Feel the body, feel the breath. Um, and resting the monkey mind, which is howling, screeching, swinging monkeys um, in the mind often. So to me and to um, many of, of you and uh, to others, resting in this way is a radical form of disrupting grind culture. It's radical to rest. Disrupting capitalism, patriarchy, colonialism, 
I would also add addiction and certainly white supremacy. And I feel especially in trauma bodies, in, in queer bodies, black bodies, indigenous, people of color, bodies of color, that um, it's especially radical to rest. It's a form of deep listening, of returning the body to its nature. Our nature is not to rush and mm, mm, push all the time. It definitely is not. And if you haven't yet, I wish for you deeply to please listen to and read the teachings of Trisha Hershey. She's known as the Knapp Bishop, and she's so many things, uh, a, a teacher, an artist, poet, theater maker, performance artist, community organizer, activist, author, uh, queen. And uh, she says it this, this way, the wideness of her practice, like she has all these ways in, She's also a chaplain. I don't think I said that. The wideness of her practice opens portals and possibilities of world building and future casting while embodying the teachings of somatics, womanism, um, womanist theology, black liberation theology, Afrofuturism, and her ancestors. Um, if you're not familiar with the term womanism and womanist theology, these are terms coined by um, Alice Walker in response to white feminist exclusionary feminism that was not including the lived experience of black women in particular. And um, yeah, so that's the context of this. So Trisha, this author, and so much more, uh, created the rest as resistance and rest as reparations frameworks. And she founded the NAP ministry. And uh, she's really studying the ways that rest disrupts um, these systems of violence and oppression and uh, reclaims our embodied nature reclaims our heart space, our our uh, dream space, as she calls it. Um, I'm not sure if I should put the links in now. Maybe I'll put them at the at the end. Just yeah. So I wanted to just name the tenants of the NAP ministry, um, which are. Perfect. <laughs> she says, rest is a form of resistance because it disrupts and pushes back against capitalism and white supremacy. In a, it, and to see rest with a capital R as an active form of resistance. You know, we think rest is so passive. So you're not doing anything. You're just resting. It's an active form of resistance. The second tenant of the NAP ministry is that our bodies are a site of liberation. And for those of you studying the Dharma, practicing the Dharma, uh, you'll recognize this is the first foundation of mindfulness, is the mindfulness of the body. This is a site of liberation. This is uh, ground zero of awakening. Mm -hmm. The third tenant of the NAP ministry is that NAPs provide a healing portal to imagine, invent, and heal. This is so beautiful. In times where we can really, I'll speak personally, be consumed by fear or a drought of hope that napping, resting, radical rest, 
is a place to imagine and vent and heal. It has this beautiful healing forward energy that feels very hopeful and inspiring. It, it's, it's this liminal space, this in-between space of not sleep and not doing a different way to access being and wisdom. And the last tenant of the Nat ministry is that our dream space has been stolen and we want it back. We will reclaim it via rest. Our dream space has been stolen by these systems of oppression. And um, we want it back and we will reclaim it via rest. Uh, Tricia shares this quote from Audre Lorde that we will never dismantle the master's house by using the master's tools. So these tools of, of greed, hatred, and delusion, the tools of separation and competition that uh, have become internalized through generations, cannot be used to dismantle these systems of oppression. And rest is a way to unplug from that and heal and revision what's possible in our interconnectedness. So my proposition is that uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not one to uh, change the dharma <laughs> i'm a bit of a purist when it comes to the dharma i admit uh, but i propose that rest may be a requisite health uh, like food clean water adequate protection for the body through clothing and housing and medicine access to health care and rest that these are requisites to soothe, to connect, to practice. My meditation practice for quite some time now, uh, in short, it looks like this, <clears throat> uh, like about five minutes, just landing in the body, just feeling where I am, feeling tensions, allowing some space around those tensions to uh, be known and not contracted onto. So just landing. And then I spend Depends on what's happening, all the conditions, but five, ten minutes maybe, letting the mind run around. Off you go. <laughs> Just blah, blah, blah. Do all the things. Think about the lists and what's bothering me and what came up today and who I want to become and, you know, whatever. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, and then I just come back and rest with the body. And then it just la 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 runs off again until I get so bored with it. It's like, oh my God, please. The same nonsense on and on, round and round. And I, instead of forcing my attention, get on that breath, girl, get on there, stay there, be there, become the great meditator. Just let the mind kind of like a puppy. Run around, run around until it's ready to rest. It's just kind of blowing off the steam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Until it's like, oh, really? <laughs> We've done it. It's like, now I want to rest. So I wait until I get to that place of like, I want to rest. And then it, it's so sweet 
to just rest on the breath. Like, you don't have to get on it, be on it. Just like a feather on a wave. I have a feather that I keep in front of me. Look at that, sweetie. Look at that, baby. Oh, so light. Just on a wave of breath. That the attention is like a feather, so light. Just uh, I'm reading a book on happiness by Matthew Ricard, and he he talks about um, attention like a butterfly on a flower where it's receiving its nourishment. Just that light touch, the sweetness. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, I hope that might be uh, helpful for you in some way with uh, life and with practice. I'm going to share a poem and then we'll practice together. Let me see. Any other bits? No. Okay. This is a poem. I'll put the link below and I'll put it in the chat here. Um, I might not be pronouncing this title properly. It's uh, from Rosemary Witola Tromer, and it's called, it's Latin, Lubricus terrestris. That's a Latin word for a worm, um, but it sounds better in Latin, I guess, earthworm. So here's Rosemary's poem. On a day when the world is weighty, dark and dense with need, I want to be the earthworm that gives itself over to tunneling. It's every movement an act of bringing spaciousness. And when minutes feel crushed by urgency, I want to meet the world worm-like, which is to say, Grounded, consistent, even slow. No matter how desperate the situation, the worm does not tunnel faster, nor burrow more. It knows it can take decades to build fine soil. To whatever is compacted, the worm offers its good worm work quietly bringing porosity to what is trodden, compressed. So often in my rush to, do, to repair, I end up exhausted. Let my gifts to the world be my constancy, a devotion to openness, my willingness to be with what is, let my gift be, let my gift to myself be patience as I tend to what is dense and dark. That's just perfect. I never imagined I would aspire to be worm like, um, but there it is. I do. Beautiful. All right, so let's uh, tuck in for a practice. Um, as you do, please consider resting. <laughs> if you would like to turn away from the computer or dim your lights or get a cushion, if there's a tendency towards striving in your practice, see, what's it like? What if I just uh, cut my heart some slack and rest? So as you're settling, see what helps your nervous system to arrive. Is it helpful to look around your space, as I mentioned, to uh, adjust your space? Is touch helpful? Holding your face or your heart, your belly. Perhaps 
perhaps sighing breaths. And we're just meeting our our whole self in this moment. If it's helpful for you to rest the eyes, either downward or closed, please do. And if you feel concerned to rest too much, your body or your eyes, that you might just fall asleep, maybe body is telling you something. It's okay. It's okay. What does it feel like to invite rest across and through and deep into your facial muscles? Those muscles of worry and seeing, the muscles of tasting and talking, of clenching, of holding back. Rest your face as if as if it remembers ease and peace. What does it feel like to invite rest down the sides and back of the neck so the Shoulder bones, feel their gravity, feel their weight. The sweet weight of the shoulders slides all the way down into resting hands. I'm feeling into the areas of the heart center and belly center where there can be places of heartache, of protection, of activation, and just inviting some space with whatever is there and seeing if some softness can move into that space you've offered. I particularly like to give a fair amount of attention to the inner layers of the belly, where this uh, vagus nerve activation uh, can trigger a real mm, adrenal response. So the inner layers of the belly softening, even to one percent. Let's see what's possible. And as the muscles soften, we may begin to feel more weightedness through the pelvis and legs and feet. Resting with the earth not on the earth, with the earth, earth rising up to hold you, allow yourself to be held. We'll practice together for another minute or two in silence, just arriving, meeting the body here and now. This first foundation of liberation.
And then with very tender care, no judgment, just checking in for yourself with the requisites. Do you have adequate health care and food and water? Do you have protection in housing and clothing? And if not, please meet this with tender care and with rest. Just for now, I'm going to rest. If the requisites are not fully stable and present for you, meeting this with metta, with compassion, may I be safe and protected. May I be well in body and mind. These are the requisites in our metta phrases. And if the requisites are present for you, to acknowledge that, to know that you have what's needed to practice. Feel the energy and mm, the inspiration to practice and to act for the liberation and well being of all. And then you could choose now to stay with metaphrases if you're using them. Self-compassion. Or just let the mind run around for a bit. Just try to loosen up the reins and just let it daydream and make lists and plans and wander around. What's it like when we give the mind permission to do this? Does part of you think, oh, that's not right? <laughs> Just try it on. you like, you could sprinkle in a little bit of comparing mind, judging mind, restlessness, doubt, the usual habits.
Sprinkle in some worry. And then when you're ready, when you really feel like, oh, I just want to rest. I just want to really uh, need, the heart, body, mind needs to rest. And I would, I'm really ready to just rest perhaps on the breath could be a different anchor of a, a sensation in the body. Again, metaphrases, just choosing an anchor gently and with a very light touch, like a feather or a butterfly. Just rest on that anchor, with that anchor, arising and passing. And like a butterfly, at times attention will flit off of the flower and gently comes back to receive that nourishment, that sweetness of resting with the anchor.
Awakening gently to our meditation practice as a liminal space between grind culture and sleep, where we practice awakening free of the dictates of grind. I usually find in the last few minutes of a meditation practice is when it's most fruitful, when you may begin to notice restlessness. And we remind heart, body, mind to rest. Or you may notice kind of a sloth or dullness take over. And so can we stay awake? to inner peace. And in a few moments, as you hear the bell, um, see if you can bring with you the thread of rest, even as we transition from this part of practicing. And so here you can either continue resting or meditating, whatever state you're in, or you can gently rejoin the circle. If you're here in the Zoom room, please don't feel any push to do that. It's okay.